Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. Our topic today concerns the uh, Franks. Remember, they were um, one of the longest lasting of the Germanic tribes. Um, their first king, his name was Clovis, actually was an Orthodox Christian. He, um, he followed the uh, Athanasian view of the Trinity and not the Arian view, which we've learned in previous lectures. A lot of these Germanic tribes were Arian in nature, um, did not believe in the Trinity and the equal substance. Um, so what we'll see with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, we already know that the East survived much longer, became what's called the Byzantine Empire. Um, but let's look now and let's focus on the Western half and what is happening in Western Europe. And that, of course, would be centered around that Germanic tribe or group called the Franks with their first king, of course, Clovis. They are centered in what is today modern France. Um, at the time, it was called Gaul. Um, and what you'll learn about with this lecture, you'll learn about, of course, Clovis and his Merovingian dynasty um, and how he united all of the different uh, Franks, uh, the different tribes together. And you'll also, of course, learn about another very famous figure in this, with this time in history, and his name, of course, is Charlemagne and the Carolingian dynasty, which he, of course, um, starts. Um, Charlemagne is extremely important. Um, during Charlemagne's reign as king, we will have uh, a Carolingian renaissance. We will, of course, this is a renaissance. This is a revival of learning that will take place in Western Europe under Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne wanted to educate priests and monks. In fact, the Benedictine monks were responsible for copying uh, a lot of manuscripts. And so we owe them a debt of gratitude because these works actually survived. Um, because instead of like the papyrus, these monks would use um, parchment or, che or, or sheepskin, which was um, very expensive, of course, um, but very effective. Also, we see during the Carolingian Renaissance, and you'll find out that new schools are established as well. In fact, uh, Charlemagne will also expand um, the Carolingian Empire, and he will, on Christmas Day in the year 800, crowned, he was crowned emperor in Rome by Pope Leo III. Um, it seems that the popes were turning away from the east and looking to the Franks for support. We'll see the, the popes in Rome, of course. Um, we already know that the church has split into the eastern side and a western side, especially with that iconoclastic controversy um, with, over the use of icons in churches. And so we'll see that the popes, of course, are going to start looking for um, support, protection from the west, from, for example, Charlemagne. Uh, Now, Charlemagne's empire in the West was very important and very powerful. Um, now we see that we have another empire now. We had the Roman Empire. Now we have another empire with the Carolingian and Charlemagne's empire. But there will be a problem, and you will, of course, learn about it. Um, eventually, Charlemagne, at his death, um, his son will take over, I believe it was Louis the Pious, and which was fine, um, but eventually we have a problem because the empire will end up being split between three sons. Um, and that is, of course, um, never a peaceful process. It always seems to result in some type of civil war um, or problems, and 
the empire as a whole, as we'll find out with the Treaty of Verdun, uh, will be divided. And you'll kind of see the, the beginnings of the modern states in Western Europe because you have France and then you have the, the middle lands where Switzerland and Belgium kind of running along north-south. And then of course you have Germany um, and so you start to see the beginnings of the modern states of Europe here with the Treaty of Verdun and this division of the Carolingian Empire. So let's learn more about um, the Franks and uh, Charlemagne and the Carolingian Empire as a whole. Good afternoon. And today we're going to talk about the, the Frankish kingdom and uh, the emergence of the, the Carolingian Empire. Now, as we've seen earlier, of the Germanic successor states in the Western Roman Empire, the one that ended up being the most successful was, of course, the Frankish state. And this was largely due to a number of factors, including A, the Franks never had to migrate very far. Uh, their homeland was near the Rhine River, so this, they simply moved into Roman territory. Uh, secondly, they established their first high king, Clovis, uh, late in the 5th century, and he became Frankish high king in um, kind of the usual Germanic manner by uh, assassinating all of your male relatives. Uh, also, Clovis converted to Christianity, and he converted to Nicene Christianity, remember, and not Arian Christianity like many of his Germanic confreres. So Clovis converted directly from paganism to Nicene Christianity, and this enabled the Franks to integrate with the native uh, Celto-Roman or Gallo-Roman population uh, in Gaul uh, much more easily than, say, the Visigoths integrated in Spain or the Ostrogoths in Italy, and certainly the Vandals in North Africa. Uh, so Clovis, immediately the benefits of conversion uh, was, or were that he was able to uh, ally himself with the, the bishoprics. And it was mainly uh, the bishops and archbishops of the old uh, province of Gaul that kept the Roman traditions alive. And kind of in the, the late Roman Empire, uh, these bishops and archbishops were more or less kind of mayors of the cities. And uh, they would preserve the administration and they would, you know, keep the, um, the, the records and the documents and the, the Romanitas. And so uh, Gaul had been heavily Romanized and so what Clovis inherited was a, a fairly um, structurally sound state. Now, um, Clovis also used his Christianity as an excuse to fight the Visigoths as we'd seen because the Visigoths were at that time Arian Christians. And so Clovis created a large state which uh, encompassed much of modern day France and then some. So it extended from the English Channel to the Bay of Biscay down to the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So he established a, a fairly large Frankish state uh, and he started a dynasty. And as we saw, the dynasty founded by Clovis is called the Merovingian dynasty after a uh, legendary mythical ancestor, Merovic. Now, Clovis um, didn't understand Roman infrastructure. I mean, he knew it was important. Uh, and he also didn't understand Roman legal traditions. The Franks had their own legal uh, tradition, as we've seen, based on the principle of Vergeld. Uh, and since the, the idea of a state was something so new and so radically different for the Franks because they'd never had one before, uh, Frankish law had said that all possessions must be divided equally amongst all uh, one's sons. So when Clovis died, he partitioned his uh, state into four chunks. And these chunks weren't contiguous chunks. They were you know, scattered here in Gaul and there in Gaul and here. And so really what happens is we have a division of uh, Clovis' estate in the, the year 511 into four smaller sub-states. Now, generally, the pattern in Merovingian history is that we'll end up with four, then it'll be reabsorbed by one of the sons, who then must redivide it amongst his two or three sons, depending on the heir. Then it will be uh, regrouped. But what starts to happen is largely Merovingian history becomes family history. Uh, throughout the sixth century, we have a series of strong and able Merovingian kings and queens. Uh, although in the 7th century, the pattern is for the Merovingian kings to become weaker and weaker and weaker. Now, a couple of things that the Merovingians do is uh, that they support monasticism. And so uh, monasteries are founded throughout the Merovingian kingdom. And these, of course, are primarily aristocratic in personnel. Um, so um, increasingly more and more Franks, uh, wealthy Franks, 
aristocratic Franks, uh, will either you know enter a monastery, or you know if you can't enter a monastery, the next best thing to do is to found one, because throughout most of the Middle Ages, kind of the fast track to heaven was seen to either become a monk or a nun, or to support a monastic uh, foundation. Uh, so uh, the Franks did contribute uh, to um, building monasteries, uh, and they also helped. Uh, in a kind of a, um, a missionary quest. Um, a, around the year 600, Pope Gregory I had started using monks as missionaries uh, to the English. So he sent missionaries up to the English uh, to convert them to Christianity, because of course the Angles and the Saxons were, were pagan. Uh, and so this trend begins throughout uh, Merovingian Gaul. Once England does convert to Christianity, one of England's chief exports, of course, becomes monks. And these are very, very active missionary monks, and the Merovingians will help use them to convert some of the, the border pagan areas. So uh, Clovis and his successors work very, very closely with Christianity. And um, of course, as we've seen for a, a period of time, uh, Clovis was the only major leader who was in communion with Rome. So this alliance between the Franks and Christianity uh, brought many, many benefits. Now, um, as you can imagine, because of the constant partitioning and then you know, reabsorption of the kingdom, civil wars in Merovingian Gaul were very, very frequent. And um, as a result, this uh, helped destabilize uh, the monarchy, but the title of king was always very, very important, that it was important that there was a king, although, um, you know, increasingly, these civil wars are endemic. Now, in the seventh century, what started to occur is often will be placed in awkward situations in which uh, we will have boy kings who inherit. So we'll have a long succession of very, very weak uh, Merovingian child kings. And increasingly, the power within the kingdom no longer rests with the king. Uh, there is an administrative official appointed called the mayor of the palace. And the mayor of the palace of the Frankish kingdom is the person who's kind of the king's right-hand man. He's the one who summons the troops. He's the one who prepares for battle. He's the one who uh, keeps the kingdom in line. Okay? So during this time, uh, what we see is the Merovingian kings become weaker. Uh, we see that uh, increasingly, uh, political authority is centered not in the king, but rather in the office of the mayor of the palace. And we start to see other tendencies as well. A lot of the Roman infrastructure begins to uh, deteriorate. One of Clovis's grandsons, in order to ingratiate himself with the people, decided to burn all the tax rolls. Well, that might be a popular thing to do, but it's difficult to collect taxes when you don't know who owns them. So, or who owes them. So rapidly, the infrastructure of the old Roman state uh, starts to kind of d collapse. And so there's less residual Roman infrastructure left apart from the very physical roads and, um, and uh, uh, churches and, and other permanent fixed structures. Uh, the office of the mayor of the palace uh, becomes more important and increasingly uh, it starts to become hereditary. And by the end of the seventh century, uh, the office itself does become hereditary under uh, one man, and this one mayor is named Pepin of Heristal. And he's able to start the process of uniting the Franks back together into one group. So instead of sub subdividing into several you know, grandsons with many um, mayors of the palace, gradually the Frankish state reemerges into one with a very weak king, but a very strong mayor of the palace. Uh, and Pepin of Heristal is able to make this office hereditary. Uh, and in fact, one of his ancestors had actually tried to take over the kingship. But at that point, uh, the Frankish nobles weren't willing to support him because it was still important that you had a Merovingian. That is, in order to be king, you had to be a descendant of Clovis. Okay? You could be a mayor of the palace and be a member of Pepin's family, but you couldn't be king. All right. Pepin of Heristal, around 687, is able to make the position hereditary. And um, his son will continue this process. Now, his son is a man named Charles, and he is known as Charles Martel because Martellus in Latin means a little hammer. And Charles Martel uh, is mayor of the palace. And as mayor of the palace, he will begin to make very, very significant contributions to the Frankish state. And in fact, in the 8th century, we'll have a, uh, what we call a renaissance within the Frankish state. In the 7th century, intellectually, things started to look kind of gloomy. Uh, and increasingly, many of the Merovingian leaders appointed Germans to the offices of uh, archbishopric and bishopric. And these are positions that had traditionally been reserved to what was left of the old Roman aristocracy. Once the um, Germans 
uh, many of them, you know, received these jobs as, as a form of patronage. So they weren't necessarily very uh, educated or very motivated or very disciplined to be a particularly effective bishop or archbishop. And increasingly, as the personnel becomes more and more Germanic, kind of the quality of the office begins to decline. Uh, we'll see a reversal of this uh, in the 8th century and um, really kind of uh, concurrent with Charles Martel's tenure as mayor of the palace, uh, we'll see a uh, renaissance throughout the, um, uh, the Frankish world, which can be seen not just through bishoprics and archbishoprics, but uh, also through monasteries, because monasteries will ensure a continuity of education in the Latin world. Each monastery had a scriptorium, and it has a library, and the rule of St. Benedict prescribes reading, Lexio Divina, divine reading. Uh, thus, it's enshrined as part of the monastic discipline to, to read. Okay. Charles Martel brings great prestige to the title of the uh, office of, um, uh, of mayor of the palace uh, for many different reasons. First of all, one of his great contributions and one of the, the ways that he's seen as the savior of Western Christianity because, is because of a battle that he fought in the year 732. And uh, the battle was fought near the city of Tours in uh, the Frankish kingdom. And what Charles Martel faced was an Arab invasion coming up from Spain. So remember, the Arabs and Moors had recently conquered Spain, and most of Spanish history throughout the medieval period is Islamic or the period of the Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain by the Christians. Uh, these Arab forces get as far north as Tours, and uh, Charles Martel is forced to, to get together forces and go and face them. And he gets together a large army, a very cavalry-heavy army, uh, and <clears throat> also, this is one of the first uses that we know of um, the stirrup. Uh, so Charles Martel had heavy cavalry that was equipped with the stirrup. The stirrup probably came in uh, with the Avars, with these migratory peoples from um, the Eurasian steppe. But Charles Martel and his forces had stirrups, and they had the large heavy cavalry. And they met the Moors in the year 732 and defeated them. Uh, but Charles did not let anyone else know that. And uh, in fact, he proclaimed himself overnight the savior of Christianity because he defeats the Moors and he pushes them south of the Pyrenees back into Spain. So Frankish, the Frankish state has been preserved, Christianity has been preserved, and so the Pyrenees will remain the boundary between uh, the Arab world and then uh, the Frankish Christian world. So Charles is a victor overnight. And in fact, Rome looks to Charles because the city of Rome is under threat by the Lombards, a Germanic group who had been Arian, but they are now Nicene, who are making inroads into the city of Rome. And just as earlier popes had predicted, once there was a schism between Rome and Constantinople over the issue of icons, Rome had threatened to appeal to the barbarians. This is exactly what Rome did. It appealed to the barbarians for aid. It appealed to Clovis for aid, or I'm sorry, it appealed to uh, Charles Martel for aid against uh, these Lombards. Now, Charles Martel couldn't do anything, and he said, well, one of the things that he was worried about was another uh, Arab invasion, and so he wasn't prepared to launch a major invasion in Italy. So Charles Martel accepted the Pope's request, but uh, essentially told him, at this moment in time, I can't help you. There was also a very irregular feature that occurred during Charles Martel's reign, and that is the Merovingian king died. And Charles was in an unusual position in which he's mayor of the palace, but there's no king. And Charles didn't even bother to find a replacement king. So this is the first time that we have a mayor of the palace uh, ruling without a king. And it was a highly irregular situation, uh, but it obviously didn't bother Charles Martel enough to try to find uh, one of the descendants of Clovis somewhere. Uh, when Charles dies, um, um, what he does is he bequeaths his position to his son, uh, who is Pepin, also known as Pepin the Short. Now, Charles uh, also followed a policy of, very, of working very, very closely with these missionary monks, um, largely coming from, uh, from England, but in sending these missionary monks out into border areas on the other side of the Rhine River. And generally, the pattern was is that you send in the monks to convert the people. Uh, once you convert the people, then you can send in colonists. And so, in many ways, Charles Martel helps to use Christianity as a vehicle for Frankish imperialism. And increasingly, more and more areas of Central Europe uh, become Christianized by means of these missionary monks. If you send these missionary monks into an area and they're all martyred, well, then you can send in the army and then you can simply conquer the area and then send in Frankish colonists. 
so rapidly, uh, more and more uh, areas of central uh, Germany are being uh, exposed to Christianity and are being brought under some degree of Frankish rule. When Charles Martel dies, his son Pepin the Short continues this policy. However, Pepin was perturbed by the situation that there was no king. And so Pepin had to look around and he was able to find in a monastery a uh, um, distant uh, descendant of Clovis and he placed him on the Merovingian throne. So we have a Merovingian king and Pepin as mayor of the palace. Now, once again, Rome writes Pepin, or Rome writes the Franks and says, we need help with the Lombards. And Pepin says, well, let me ask you a question. Who should have uh, the title of king? He who actually has the title or he who actually has the power? And Rome, knowing exactly what Pepin was getting at, responded, he who has the power. And in a fairly large ceremony, uh, Pepin had the last Merovingian deposed and sent back to the monastery. And in a big ceremony, uh, uh, the, um, the missionary monk Boniface anoints Pepin king, done in a very Old Testament tradition. And so here we have a change of, of dynasty. So we'll move in the year 751 from the Merovingian dynasty in Frankish Gaul to the Carolingian dynasty. And of course, Pepin becomes king as King Pepin III. Um, as king, Pepin immediately invades Italy and defeats the Lombards. And uh, Rome is so happy that it has Pepin crowned again. And so he's undisputably the king of the Franks. You no longer need Merovingian blood in order to be a king. Now we have a new dynasty, the Carolingians. Um, Pepin's forced to invade Italy a second time when the Lombards began to cause Rome yet even further problems. And uh, what Pepin does is he takes a large chunk of Lombard territory in central Italy and he gives it directly to the Pope. This is known as the donation of Pepin. Now many in Rome were uncomfortable with the situation that they'd been given territory by a Frankish king and so a spurious document began to circulate at Rome known as the Donation of Constantine which uh, wasn't established as a forgery until the 15th century although it claims that the Emperor Constantine back in the 4th century had actually given the Pope um, all of the Western Roman Empire and had moved off to Constantinople and you know kind of a, a, a way of telling Pepin, well, you can't give us this territory because we actually already own it. Um, but Pepin establishes a very, very uh, strong alliance with Rome, and so Pepin becomes the defender of Rome. So Rome no longer looks to Constantinople for aid, and Rome rather looks to the Franks. And Pepin establishes a new dynasty. Now, when Pepin dies, he has two sons, and so according to Frankish law, he must divide his empire into two parcels. And this happens. We have Charles and we have Carloman. And as it turns out, Carloman was the archetypical bad brother. Uh, the two brothers didn't get along. Uh, he never would help Carloman, or never would help Charles, rather, in any of his military endeavors. And as it happens, Carloman uh, dies four years after they uh, inherit the kingdom. And so what Charles does is he absorbs his uh, dead brother's kingdom, and his uh, dead brother's widow and, and child have to flee to the Lombards. And so this Charles, the second Carolingian, uh, is better known to us as Charlemagne or Charles the Great, Charlemagne. And what Charlemagne does is changes the nature of the Carolingian state. And he does this largely through his constant military activity. That is, uh, Charles reigns from 768 to 814, and through his constant military activity, Charles will, will be fighting here and there and here, and he establishes many, many different fronts. Um, one of the first fronts he has is in Bavaria, in um, the area which is now southern Germany. Uh, he's able to conquer Bavar Bavaria and incorporate it into uh, his state. Uh, he has trouble with the Lombards again, and he finally conquers the Lombards and absorbs northern Italy, and it becomes part of the Frankish state. Um, he fights the Avars, uh, the Eurasian peoples who had established a state in kind of modern-day Hungary. Um, he defeats the Avars. Um, many of the Slavic frontier people, say in the modern-day Czech Republic, Poland, uh, become tributaries of uh, Charlemagne as these areas are brought under Frankish control. Uh, he also opens up a front in the Pyrenees, and Charlemagne uh, invades northern Spain. Now, this invasion has been immortalized in what is known today as the French national epic, Roland's Song. 
Now, what actually happened is uh, Charlemagne invaded northern Spain, and the group that he fought with the most were, was the Basques, who actually were Christian rather than the Muslims. But he's ab able to establish small Christian frontier states, the Spanish March is what we call them, on the south side of the Pyrenees. And it's really from the Spanish March states, areas like Navarre, that um, the Reconquista will begin. So branching off from these, these, uh, these small uh, Christian sub-states just south of the Pyrenees. The one area that Charlemagne has the most difficulty uh, is with Saxony in what is now mo mo uh, mo modern northern Germany. Um, the Saxons were pagan, and um, Charlemagne, you know, typical tradition following uh, dad and, and grandfather, would send in the, the monks. The monks, you know, might get massacred, might get martyred, uh, then you send in the troops. Uh, for over 30 years, Charlemagne campaigns against the Saxons. And generally what he does is once he defeats them, he forces them to accept Christianity. Now, can you do this? Um, many of Charlemagne's advisors said, no, you can't force anyone to convert to Christianity. But Charlemagne thought otherwise. And that way, once he conquers the Saxons, he takes them all down to the nearest river and has them all baptized. They're Christians. Then when they revolt against him again, they are apostates, right? So this is Charlemagne's policy. Uh, and we know from the sources that the general pattern is the Saxons will revolt. They are forcibly converted to Christianity. Once Charlemagne leaves, they will go back to their pagan practices. And um, we have some sources that tell us that they like to convert to Christianity because they were given a white cloak before they were baptized. And in fact, if they were baptized three or four times, it was a way to accumulate a larger wardrobe by collecting more of these white cloaks. Charlemagne finally becomes so frustrated with the Saxons that he invades the area and he forcibly resettles many Saxons deep in Frankish territory and then resettles Franks deep in Saxon territory to try to uh, stabilize the area. Okay, so Charlemagne is great through his constant military activity. That is, every year he's fighting. And so he may be in Saxony, he may be in Bavaria, he may be in Italy, he may be uh, in um, Eastern Europe, and he may be south of the Pyrenees. So it's this constant vigorous military activity through which Charlemagne is able to keep his uh, kingdom together. What he does is he creates the largest empire uh, that the West has seen since the Western Roman Empire. So he creates a large state that incorporates uh, not only modern-day France, the Low Countries, Germany, Switzerland, Northern Italy, Austria, Hungary, um, but even uh, fringe areas, say parts of um, uh, Slovenia and Croatia, uh, in Poland as well. Um, what Charlemagne realizes is that in an empire this size, he needs good administrators, and Charlemagne focused on education. Now, his predecessors had done this, but not to the extent to which Charlemagne will. And what he does is he begins to uh, order uh, capitularies, that as a king, he will add to the existing Frankish law by uh, uh, issuing charters and demanding that subjects do certain things. Um, and first of all, he demands that all monasteries have schools which are open to all children, and that is non-monastic children as well. So uh, the Frankish um, nobility now can send their kids to school in monasteries. And so Charlemagne is very concerned with education. He establishes a capital of the city of Aachen in modern-day Germany, A-A-C-H-N, and he brings the best and the brightest from all over the empire, and, and then even outside the empire. So he brings Lombards and Visigoths and even some Anglo-Saxons to his palace at Aachen. He has a school at Aachen at the palace school, and then he sends uh, these people who are trained out to monasteries. And so these monasteries have the best and the most able. Uh, and we talk about a Carolingian Renaissance because there will be an explosion of Latin literature during the, the uh, ninth century. Um, so he has a large empire, he needs administrators, he helps encourage and he fosters learning, uh, both for monks, for priests, and for lay people. Uh, he's very concerned with education, as we've seen, although he himself was illiterate. Uh, the sources tell us that he, had, he kept a wax tablet under his pillow, and he tried to make the letters, and he tried to learn to write, but he uh, tried too late in his life and never was able to, uh, to accomplish this feat. Uh, he understood Frankish. 
uh, and he could apparently understand, he could speak Latin and understand it, and he could understand Greek as well. Uh, he simply was not literate himself, but he surrounded himself with the best and the brightest and the most literate of his age, and he encouraged education. That is, he wanted everybody to be literate. So he has at kind of a think tank of, at Aachen of the best and the brightest from all over. All of the education is done in Latin. One of the um, kind of uh, residual effects of the Roman Empire is that Latin remains the administrative, the bureaucratic, and the functional language. So everything, Latin is the official language. So everything's uh, done in Latin. Uh, there had been a written Gothic language created by Ufulas, uh, but that died out in the 6th century, largely, be largely because of its association with Arianism. Uh, so all of the reforms done within Charlemagne's kingdom are done in Latin. Now, Charlemagne also creates a new system of administrators called Mizi Dominici, or those sent by the Lord. And the Mizi are, consist of two people. That is, you have a religious and a layperson, and you are paired up, and you are sent to geographical districts from where you're not from. You can't be from that area. And you are sent to, uh, to administer, to collect taxes, to kind of be foci of royal power. And so it's important for Charlemagne to keep this empire together. He needs to have trained and literate administrators all throughout the empire. He obviously can't be everywhere at once, but every year he is on a campaign somewhere. And this was largely how he was able to keep his empire together. Now, um, Charlemagne issues capitularies about many, many different issues, uh, but many of them do concern administration and education. Uh, and one in particular concerns writing. And Charlemagne is very worried because he says that scribes are writing corruptly. Now, uh, after the fall of the, the Roman Empire in the West, many different regional scripts began to develop. And these were very, very uh, often, if you were from Northern Italy, you may not be able to read a script that was written in England, despite the fact that it was in Latin, because the handwriting changed so much. What Charlemagne uh, commanded was that handwriting uh, become standardized. And it, this was happening, uh, gradually this was happening throughout his monastic schools, but uh, as part of this Carolingian Renaissance, we have a standardization of handwriting, and this is known as the creation of a Caroline minuscule hand. Uh, so it's a lowercase hand, Caroline minuscule, which is written very, very clearly. Um, it is actually, uh, in the, the 15th century when the printing press was discovered and you know people agreed that they needed a standardized font, they went back and they looked at manuscripts and they found manuscripts that were copied uh, during the time of Charlemagne written in this Carolingian script. And the Renaissance humanists in the 15th century looked at the script and said it was so clear and it was so nice that must have been the way the Romans wrote. Well, in fact, it wasn't. It was the way Carolingians wrote. But it became um, the, the standard script uh, and it is essentially the, the New Times Roman script that we use today is actually a Carolingian minuscule script. So Charlemagne didn't create the script, but he encouraged it, and paleographical trends within his empire were moving in that direction uh, anyways. So handwriting's reformed. The number of manuscripts uh, copied multiplies. We have a large uh, increase in the level of literacy. Now, what this means is that for the Frankish nobles, most of their kids uh, would have been literate. So we have a, a large uh, portion of uh, society, a larger portion of society who was literate, or which was literate. And when we say a larger portion, we're talking maybe 8, 9 percent. I mean, statistically, uh, in today's term, not, not very significant. But we have trained administrators who can function in Latin. Uh, we have a good bureaucracy. We have, uh, you know, uh, schools within monasteries, external schools. And so there are lots of opportunities for lay people to receive an education, and lay boys and girls. Um, but what happens is increasingly manuscripts are copied. Uh, now people, the, the, the group of intellectuals with whom Charlemagne surrounds himself, uh, do things like uh, revive Latin poetry. So we have new Latin poetic forms. Um, they begin to copy manuscripts. Uh, they begin to uh, revive Latin literature. Um, they're particularly not very uh, philosophically inventive, uh, but they are very preoccupied by theological matters. And so we have a resurgence in theological thought, mainly um, Augustine. So people are, um, um, we have more and more scriptural commentaries. We have more and more um, um, exegesis on uh, scripture. Um, not a whole lot of innovative stuff, though. Uh, we have some new history. Uh, we have Einhard, we have Notker the Stammerer, we have historians uh, who used 
Suetonius as their basis to uh, write biographies. So we have the revival of the biographical format, which we hadn't seen since the fall of the Roman Empire. So although we have a lot of literature, most of the stuff that we have isn't particularly innovative or isn't very new. And although we talk about a Carolingian Renaissance, it's often a Renaissance with a small R rather than a capital R. Uh, because much of the artwork uh, is, is simply uh, imitative uh, of, uh, of Roman styles and Roman themes, and m much of it doesn't survive. Much of the Carolingian structures, many of them would have been um, uh, created out of wood. In terms of artwork, uh, gospel books and the painting of gospels is one of the major forms of Carolingian art that we have. There's a famous equestrian statue of Charlemagne, uh, which is Charlemagne portrays himself as a Roman emperor. And also the palace at Aachen is rebuilt, so it really looks like San Vitale. And of course, because Charlemagne likes to pretend that he's a Roman emperor, uh, he has materials imported from Italy. And so he you know, kind of creates this, this facade of a Roman em emperor, empire, uh, despite the fact that he's a Germanic king. All right. Now, if it weren't for this Carolingian Renaissance, however, very little of ancient uh, Latin literature would have survived. And in fact, 90% of the Latin literature, classical Latin literature that we have today, survives in its earliest manuscript as a Carolingian copy. So if it weren't for this smaller Renaissance, uh, much of Latin literature, so Caesar, Tacitus, Sallust, many of the famous Latin authors, we simply wouldn't have. So the, the Carolingians contributed enormously uh, to what we know of uh, ancient, the ancient Roman world. Now, often the climax of Charlemagne's uh, reign is, comes on the 25th of December in the year 800. Now, what had happened is earlier there had been a conspiracy in Rome. And we have different sources uh, narrating all of the details, which seem to be particularly sordid. Uh, but whatever happened, the Pope, Pope Leo III, was attacked. Uh, he was brutally attacked, and his attackers attempted to rip out his tongue and eyes. There were a series of charges laid against the Pope. Uh, what Leo did is he escaped Rome, and he got out of Rome because he was in fear for his life. And he made it north of the Alps, and he got to Charlemagne, and he said, Charlemagne, please help me. And Charlemagne thought about it, and he said, okay, I've got to help the Pope. So he marches Leo back to Rome, and he says, wait a second, you know, you Roman mob has attacked the Pope. We need to try the Pope. So the Pope has to be tried in order to uh, determine whether all of these crimes of which he was accused were actually true. Now the problem is, how do you try a Pope? Well, Charlemagne had the Pope swear on gospels and relics of St. Peter that he was innocent, and he swore, and um, of course he was uh, innocent. That is, the bolt of lightning came down to strike him dead. So the ordeal, this is an ordeal, an immediate judgment of God, which was a standard part of, of Frankish law. Uh, and according to some sources, his accusers, when they attempted to do the same, uh, either went crazy or went mad or were punished in different ways. And so Charlemagne was able to see that the Pope uh, was tried and was exonerated of all the charges against him. Now, Pope Leo III is so happy. He says, Charlemagne, it's going to be Christmas in a couple of days. Why don't you stay in Rome, and we will celebrate Mass together at St. Peter's. And Charlemagne says, well, it is wintertime, and I won't be able to cross the Alps, so I'll stay. And on uh, the 25th of December in the year 800, Pope Leo III and Charlemagne enter St. Peter's. And they get up to the altar, and uh, Charlemagne apparently kneels, and Pope Leo pulls out this crown and puts it on his head and declares him emperor of the Romans. Now, what just happened? Well, we ourselves aren't really sure, and the primary sources are conflicted on this issue. Uh, generally, the pro-Charlemagne sources tell us that Charlemagne didn't know what was going on. If he knew that anything like this would have happened, he never would have gone to church with Pope Leo. The pro-papal sources tell us that Charlemagne knew exactly what was going on, that he knew that he was going to be crowned emperor and that he wanted that title. He wanted Leo to crown him. Um, well, on some level, it had to have been orchestrated because according to the sources, once Leo places the crown on his head, the, the throngs at St. Peter jump up and hail him uh, emperor of the Romans. It's also a strange title, too, because in the year 800, who was a Roman? Of course, if you lived in the city of Rome, you were, but Charlemagne was a Frank. Most of his empire consisted of uh, Celto-Romans and Gaul, Bavarians, Saxons, Lombards. So, you know, what does this title mean? 
What we know is that the title added absolutely nothing to his authority. Uh, but he liked using it. So he liked the title of emperor, and Charlemagne uh, thought it was very important that his uh, co-emperor in Constantinople recognize him as emperor. And in fact, because of the iconoclastic issue, uh, you know, there was a, a division between the East and the West, and Charlemagne, Charlemagne even has his advisors write a book about uh, icons in which, you know, uh, that he explains that they, they are to be used, but you don't worship them themselves. And so he attempts to um, try to work out an iconoclastic, uh, or try to work out a position on icons with Constantinople. Uh, the emperors in Constantinople are not interested uh, in hearing him being called Emperor of the Romans because, of course, that was their title. Although they spoke Greek in Constantinople, they still saw themselves as Romans or Romanoi, as they said. Uh, eventually, uh, the emperors in the East will recognize Charlemagne as emperor, but I'm, for, in all uh, practical purposes, they saw Charlemagne as kind of a, a primitive warlord barbarian who, you know, sure, they can give him a fancy title, but, you know, he's certainly not an emperor. And other things, too, that generally, you know, when the emperor of Constantinople addresses an equal or treats an equal, you give similar gifts, such as uh, purple, purple clothing, imperial clothing, and they never would have done that for Charlemagne. Uh, it, uh, the um, Umayyad Caliphate actually sent Charlemagne an elephant, and that made Charlemagne very, very happy because he had an elephant, and you know he received it uh, from uh, the, the Arab forces, so that made him very excited. But Charlemagne likes using the title. It added absolutely nothing to his authority, and in fact, when popes try to dictate foreign policy to them, to him rather, he essentially tells them, uh, "Well, you know, why don't you you sit down and pray, and I will go ahead." and um, deal with, with military matters, so these don't concern you. Uh, in fact, uh, I will deal with military matters, and it's your duty, Holy Father, to pray like Moses and help me in that, that respect. All right, now, so a couple of versions. It seems on some level that the Pope might have been trying to make Charlemagne a subordinate by crowning him himself. Uh, what we know is that Charlemagne crowned his eldest son emperor himself, but due to political reasons, his eldest son ran down to Rome to get recrowned, and so this sets a precedent. And the precedent is is that in order to be an emperor, you need to be crowned by the Pope. Now, the title that Charlemagne receives is Emperor of the Romans. Now, this title will continue throughout the ninth century. Then there's going to be a hiatus. Uh, the title will reemerge in the 10th century, but it'll reemerge as Holy Roman Emperor, which will, is something which is a little bit different. So Charlemagne's actual title is uh, Emperor of the Romans. And uh, he likes it, although it adds nothing to his power. He doesn't like the fact that he got it from the Pope, uh, but it's important to him that everybody around him recognizes that he's an emperor. So Charlemagne creates a large superstate uh, that includes much of Western and uh, Central Europe. He fosters education, and he lays the foundations for a new bureaucracy and a new infrastructure that's something different. So we have a, an interesting combination of, of the Roman, of the Germanic, and of the Christian, so molding themselves together into this new and distinct Carolingian Empire. And the Carolingian Empire uh, will survive uh, for, depending on where you are, survive into the 10th century. And here's what happens. Now, according to Germanic law, remember, Charlemagne is required to divide his kingdom amongst all of his sons. As so it happened, there was only one son left alive, and that son ends up being Louis. And he's known to us as Louis the Pious. And generally in history, when kings receive epithets like the pious or the mild or religious, that's generally a sign that they were very weak political rulers. And as it happened, Louis was. Unlike his father, Louis was very well educated and very, very concerned about church affairs. Uh, he liked church councils. He wanted uniformity. Uh, one of the things that he did is that he saw uh, the, all the various um, editions of Jerome's Vulgate that were out there and that they were a mess because the manuscripts that were copied, there were many, many scribal errors. And so he wanted them cleaned up. And he said, let's clean them up. And so he wanted a standard Bible that was free from scribal errors. Uh, Louis also liked Benedictine monasticism, the form of monasticism founded by Benedict of Nursia. And he legislates that there's only one form of monasticism for his whole kingdom, and that is Benedictine monasticism. Uh, so he was very concerned with church affairs. He was very, very educated. The Carolingian Renaissance continues under Louis the Pious. However, Louis wasn't the military man that his father was. 
Charlemagne was able to keep his empire together through constant military activity. Uh, Louis wasn't able to do this. Uh, and as a result, we start to see problems. And the problems accumulate as Louis has more sons. And uh, he becomes king in 811. Uh, as we've seen, he had to run down to Rome to get recrowned, despite the fact that his father had crowned him emperor. So the precedent set. In order to be a, uh, a Roman emperor, emperor of the West, you have to be crowned by the Pope. Louis usually has good relations with Rome. However, he has very, very sloppy family relations. Uh, his sons, because there are so many, start to rebel. And what Louis needs to do is come up with various succession strategies. And throughout his lifetime, he will arrange for one son to inherit, say, Aquitaine, or one to inherit Bavaria, or one to inherit uh, Saxony, or one to inherit Italy, and to come up with different arrangements. Uh, he initially has three sons, uh, and they're not particularly uh, happy with one another, and they all foment rebellions in different areas. Now, the situation becomes more complicated in 829. Uh, Louis remarries and has another son, Charles. And so now we have three sons and a younger kid added into the mix. And so much of the remainder of Louis' uh, reign is very, very difficult. And in fact, at one point, uh, one of his sons kidnaps him and places him under house arrest and um, deposes him. And the Frankish nobles are horrified by this because you can't do that. You can't depose a king. Um, so, you know, Louis is forced to do penance and then he's king again. So there's a lot of uh, bad family relations in um, Louis' immediate family. And so you can imagine it was a very, very difficult political and familial uh, relation or problem for uh, Louis. Now, Louis comes up with many different succession uh, uh, schemas for his sons, uh, but as we've seen uh, throughout the, the 830s, uh, they're usually constantly in revolt, and these revolts will come to, the head in, uh, come to a head in 840. Uh, and when Louis dies that, in that year, it's really not clear exactly who's going to inherit. At that point, there's only three sons left alive. One of Louis' the sons, Louis' sons was named Pepin, and uh, in the midst of these wars of the brothers, uh, young Pepin is actually blinded and dies, and, and Louis himself was just sickened by the whole fact that his, his sons could fight amongst themselves and even kill one another. Uh, but when Louis does die, it's really not clear who's going to inherit what. And at this point, there are two brothers and then the younger half-brother, Charles, left alive. And these brothers are Louis, Lothar, and Charles. And as it happened, uh, Charles and Louis agreed that they would team up against their older brother, Lothar. And remember, this it's problematic because now we have an imperial title, too. You just don't have kings. You have an emperor. And how do you d divide an imperial title? Can you have three emperors, or should there only be one? So we have three who are fighting for a piece of the pie. Now, as it happens, Charles allies with Louis. And uh, they're going to ally together against their older brother, Lothar. And here's how it works. Charles, uh, who had grown up primarily in the western part of the Frankish kingdom, uh, allies with Louis, who had grown up in the eastern part, and his home base was the eastern part of the Frankish kingdom, um, meet together um, at um, the city of Strasbourg in France. And in the year 842, one, they take what's known as the Strasbourg Oaths. And the Strasbourg Oaths are important because Charles and his troops pledged that they would obey Louis and his troops in all matters that were against Lothar. Okay? But what's significant is that they made this pledge in the language of the other uh, brother and their troops. So uh, Charles of all, uh, who grew up in the West, had his soldiers take the oath in Old High German. Louis the German, Louis the German, had his soldiers take the oath in Old French. This is the first indication we have, the written indication we have, of Old French and Old High German, and this is the Strasbourg Oaths. So uh, brother and half-brother, Charles of Bald, Louis the German, agree that they're going to team up and they're going to do everything they can to fight Lothar. And they do. So they take the Strasbourg Oaths, they fight Lothar, and the end result is 843, is the Treaty of Verdun. And in the Treaty of Verdun, the old Frankish state is partitioned into three chunks. 
Uh, it'll be partitioned into a western portion, a central portion, and an eastern portion. The western portion goes to Charles the Bald, who becomes king of the West Franks. Uh, the eastern portion, which looks a lot like modern-day Germany and then some, uh, goes to Louis the German. And um, the middle portion, or the middle kingdom, uh, is kind of a geographical, geographical monstrosity. And it doesn't have a modern-day ca counterpart, but it's a big sliver of land that extends all the way from the North Sea down to uh, Rome. And so it, it includes the Aachen Rome axis, all right, and it includes the Rhineland. Uh, so it would include Low Countries, Alsace, Lorraine, uh, much of Switzerland, the Alps, Northern Italy, everything down to Rome. This kingdom is called Lotharingia. Uh, the kingdom itself no longer survives uh, except in names. The French province of Lorraine comes from Lotharingia, as in the German province. The German name for Lorraine is Lotharingia. So this is Lothar's kingdom. And Lothar actually got the best deal because he gets the Rhineland, he gets great agricultural land, he gets Aachen and Rome. Um, but the Treaty of Verdun is like unlike any of the other previous Frankish partitions because it's done so rationally. Each side hired assessors, and these assessors measured the land and measured the territory and made sure the boundaries between the three kingdoms were logical. So they followed rivers, they followed mountains, and they made sure that nobody had a vassal in the territory of the other. So all of Lothar's vassals would be in his own territory. He didn't have any in the territory of Charles the Bald or Louis the German. Okay, so it's it, it the most rational Frankish partition that we've had up to this date. But now we have three Frankish states. The grandsons of Charlemagne have divided the Frankish state into the West Frankland, Lotharingia, and the East Frankland. Okay? Now, um, as you can imagine, uh, this arrangement isn't ideal. Lothar gets the imperial title. So Lothar becomes emperor of the Romans, and he has the Middle Kingdom. Now, as to what happened, Lothar has many, many children. And um, he's forced to divide Lotharingia on his deathbed up into three uh, areas. And so Lotharingia becomes much smaller as we have now Provence, uh, a truncated Lotharingia, so a redivision. Uh, the imperial title will bounce around. Um, as it happens, some of Lo Lothar's sons don't have any children, and that'll give Louis the German, Charles the Bald, an opportunity to absorb much of Lotharingia. So within a very short period of time, the Middle Kingdom disappears on the map, and the imperial title will bounce around. Uh, Charles the Bald in the West Frankland will inherit the title Emperor of the Romans for a while. It'll bounce around, and then there'll be a long hiatus, because as we'll see, uh, the Franks won't have time to worry about the imperial title because they're going to be too busy fighting Vikings and Magyars and Saracens and Arabs. So the, the Frankish kingdom uh, within three generations after Charlemagne is hit on all fronts. And even during Charlemagne's day, we already start to see Viking incursions in the north and of course in England and Ireland as well. Uh, so what Charlemagne creates is a dynasty uh, which is fairly stable, a little bit more stable than the Merovingian dynasty. He's also able to uh, put a good infrastructure in place. So we have the best bureaucracy and the best infrastructure that we've seen in Western Europe since the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, and there will be much uh, residual importance of the, the uh, Carolingian uh, kingdoms because the whole imperial ideal is revived and many political theorists think about it and it seems essential that you need an emperor in the West and this is very important in medieval political theory because even after we have many many different kings there's always the question of well, who is the emperor what is the relationship between the emperor and the other kings. Now the Carolingian dynasty survives into uh, the 10th century uh, in the area of the West, Fra West Frankland, uh, the last Carolingian dies out in 987. In the area of the East Frankland, uh, or Germany, uh, the last Carolingian dies out in 911. And it's around 900 that the last Carolingian uh, dies out in Italy. Uh, but really, late Carolingian history, especially in the 10th century, the late 9th and early 10th century, late Carolingian history ends up becoming a little bit like Merovingian history because it's family history. Uh, and gradually, kings become weaker and weaker. And in order to garner more and more warriors, what kings begin to do is to begin to give away land. And that is, they give away land to their best warriors in order to ensure that they will have enough uh, cavalrymen or enough knights to fight for them. And this is a process 
and which you would attach a public duty to, uh, to private land. It's a process which is known as feudalism, and we'll talk about it in later lectures. Uh, but the later Carolingians become weaker and weaker as more and more of the land is given out. And in reality, what starts to happen, uh, especially in the area of the West Franks, is that many people who are in theory subordinates of the king, such as counts and dukes, actually in reality control much more land, have many more vassals, and are far more powerful. Uh, kings become weaker in the late 9th and the 10th century as counts and dukes and many of the lower echelons of the, the feudal hierarchy uh, gain more prestige and more titles and more land. Uh, so a very low point in the history of kingship is uh, the, the late 9th and early 10th century. And essentially, the history of the West Franks is a history of, of counts and dukes rather than a history of kings. Uh, and we will look more at this topic when we discuss feudalism. Thank you. Well, we see, of course, that we, we had a revival of sorts of an empire in the West under the leadership of the Franks and eventually uh, a man by the name of Charlemagne. Um, we start off, of course, with the Franks with the Merovingian dynasty. And you've seen how we eventually progress to um, Charlemagne and his family who are the Carolingian dynasty. Um, when we come back for our next lecture, uh, our topic will be the Magyars, which will be centered in the area of Hungary, the Moors, uh, Muslims um, coming into Western Europe and invading, and the Vikings. And we'll find that uh, during the Middle Ages, that Europe will be experiencing a lot of invasions from these three different people. And this will help, of course, these invasions will help to develop what is called feudalism, which will be, of course, another lecture in this series. But this, these invasions, and, and a lot of times people seeking protection from uh, these groups of people will help to create what will be known as feudalism and of course which you'll learn about in one of our upcoming lectures. Until next time.